Welcome to the Teachers on Fire podcast, where I profile agents of growth and transformation in education today. Each guest shares their highs, their lows, their passions, their goals, and the resources that are shaping their thinking and inspiring their practice. For show notes and links from each episode, visit teachersonfire.net. You can also follow the show at Teachers on Fire on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And of course, please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm your host, Tim Cavey. Let's meet today's guest. Today, I've got on the line Adam Welcome. Adam is an author, speaker, former teacher, principal, director of innovation, co-founder and author of Kids Deserve It, and author of Run Like a Pirate. Follow Adam on Twitter, if you're not already, at Mr. Adam Welcome, and at his blogs at MrAdamWelcome.com and KidsDeserveIt.com. Adam, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Are you ready to talk education? Let's do it. Education, running, you name it, man. Let's uh, let's get going. I'm down. We're going to get into all of that good stuff. So why don't we start by talking a little bit more about your current context in education. What does your, let's say, your job look like on a daily basis? Tell us about your community. So my current job is uh, I'm, I'm a full-time speaker and author, and um, I'm only six months into that. And uh, previously, I was a uh, I was a teacher, elementary school teacher, and then I was a vice principal, and then I was a I was an elementary school principal. I was actually principal where I went to school, which was pretty cool to come kind of come full circle. And then I was a director of innovation for a couple years for a pretty large school district in the in the Bay Area of California where I live. We had fifty schools. 35,000 students, and I just ran all the coding and robotics and classroom design and PD for the, uh, for the entire district. And um, on the side, I was speaking and writing, and my speaking was come, becoming more speaking and more speaking, and basically my side hustle has turned into my main hustle. And now I just, uh, I just speak and, and write full-time, so it's... Uh, it's awesome. I travel a lot, but um, when I'm home, I'm home, which is great for the family. And, uh, you know, I, I might go back to a school one day. I, I tell my wife, maybe I'll go back and be a principal in a few years. I, I miss it. I don't miss everything about it, but sure. I definitely miss a lot of a lot of things about it. I miss the community and I miss building, building a culture at a school. But, um, you know, my feeling is when things come to you, I didn't see writing books coming to me. I didn't see speaking coming to me even five years ago. You gotta, you gotta hop on and you gotta, and you gotta write it and you gotta see what you can do. And, you know, people ask me all the time. They, people ask me all the time, do you miss teaching? And I feel that I'm still a teacher, Tim, to be completely honest. I just have different students. My students are not right in front of me all the time. So I think it's all just kind of perspective and how you look at it. But um, yeah, that's what uh, that's what I'm up to right now, and it's uh, I'll tell you, it's it's awesome. I don't need to wear a shirt and tie anymore. I wake <laughs> up and I put on my flip flops, yeah. and um, you know, my day is my day, and um, it's busy. I'm still not I'm not just hanging out. I definitely am uh, capitalizing and maximizing every single day, which is uh, which is awesome. That's fantastic, and I I really like what you said about still being a teacher. I mean, that's my entire philosophy, and that's my view of things. That's why I have the administrators and some of the speakers and authors that I do on a podcast called Teachers on Fire. I really think we're all teaching and we're all learning, right? These are just continuous journeys that maybe change in, in shape and function with the title and position, but hopefully we're all sharing the learning as we go. And I know you've got some great messages to share, so look forward to getting into those. But first of all, Adam, it's story time. Share with us about a low moment or some kind of an experience of adversity that you faced somewhere along that education journey and describe how you overcame it. Yeah, so I wish I could tell my 23-year-old self what my 35 year old self knew and you <laughs> yeah. know you just you just can't and i would say a low moment was when i was in the classroom i uh, i was at a great school i was having a great time doing doing a lot of fun things and i just had you know i had some i had some colleagues that didn't see education how how i saw it and 
I, I'm going to just say that I didn't feel that they were putting kids first. They were putting themselves first. And there was a, uh, in my, in my voice, a lot of, uh, a lot of professional jealousy where I felt we were doing fun things. And I felt that the worksheets and the packets and the regurgitation of information that they were having their kids do was boring. And you could tell, and they had behavior problems and there wasn't laughter in their classes and um, it was low. It was a hard time for me because I've almost left education about 10, 15 times over the years just because, man, I am so passionate about what I do and spreading uh, the education message. It's just really hard for me to wrap my head around people that don't have that same message when they're not there for the kids, basically. So, what I learned really quickly and really early on was this too shall pass. And it can pass in many different ways. Some people wait it out and they think, well, if I just wait, it's going to get better. And to be honest, people don't change. So what I did was I just changed grade levels. I moved grade levels. And then what I did was, you know what? I went and got my admin credential. And I said, you know what? What I can do is I can get my admin credential and try to become become a principal and <clears throat> push the culture across my entire school right. and not just my classroom. And that's, and that's what I did, you know, so you can talk about it and you can complain about it, or you can double down and put your money where your mouth is and actually do something about it. Because so many people complain about things when they're having a low moment or when they're frustrated or whatever it may be. And you just got to remember complaining is not a strategy. And some people just do it incessantly all the time. Right. And that negative that negative energy just like begets negative energy. Then everyone's negative and it brings you down and then you just can't see the light. And this too shall pass. Stay positive and just do something about it. Mm. That's uh, that's my advice. And that's how I overcame it. And that's how I overcome things to this day. I mean, nothing's perfect. Things aren't perfect in my life and my work. And, you know, things come up and you just got to tackle them and stay positive and just make your way through. Adam, let's talk more about that idea of putting kids first. So a, a theme that I see all over my Twitter PLN is hashtag kids deserve it. And that's something I first heard about, I think, in episode 28 of this podcast with a guest named Jordan Pachuba, a teacher in Florida. So he first introduced me to you and that idea of kids deserve it. It traces its roots back to another book that you published, this one in 2016 with another one of my PLN heroes, Todd Nezloni. So talk more about the heart of the Kids Deserve It movement and speak to those teachers like myself that are that are still a little new to this idea. Why do you think it resonates so powerfully? And just talk to us more about what, what's at the essence of this idea. How did it become a book? Yeah, so thanks for asking. Kids Deserve It. When Todd and I met, we met on Twitter, obviously, because I don't know where you else, I don't know where you meet anybody else. <laughs> and then we connected in in person at a conference, at a at a national principal conference. And I, I'd been saying kids deserve it for years because I felt the other schools in my district weren't getting the same uh, treatment and things at my school, and that was just my personal opinion. And when Todd and I get to, got together. I said something at dinner one night. I said, schools don't exist so we can have jobs. They exist for kids. And mm. Todd was kind of stalking me at dinner, I like to say. We joke about it. <laughs> and he tweeted that out with the hashtag kids deserve it because I had said after it, kids deserve it. And the tweet just went like blew up um, mm. like within the, within the first couple hours. So we were like, we got to do something with this. So we were just talking. I said, we should, we, we should write a blog post together. So we met the next morning, got together, wrote a blog post about relationships because relationships matter most. They always have and they always will. And people just really responded to it. And you know, our initial goal was not to write a book. Tim, it was just to change education. We just wanted to put our message out there. And I would recommend that to anybody who wants to, who thinks they want to write a book, don't forget, forget about the book. And I know that maybe sounds counterintuitive from the guy who's written three. I have, I have another book coming out in a month, but it doesn't start there. It starts with building your PLN, with putting your message out there. If it's a podcast, if it's a blog, podcasting, in my opinion, is the new blogging. I think everyone should have a podcast because 
it's easy to listen and it's so easy to publish, you know, in 2019, 20 years ago, blogging was where it was at because podcasting really wasn't a thing. Right. And it just took off from there. We just built a community of people doing what's best for kids regardless. And I really think the book speaks to people because we wrote the book that we wanted to read. We didn't write some book that you read in teacher credential program that has all this research and it's written by some doctorate that's never spent a day in a classroom or maybe taught for two years and you really can't relate. Right. Our book is easy to read. It's relatable. You can open it up to one chapter, read a chapter, go to work, talk about it at a staff meeting. It just makes sense. Kids deserve it. Do the adults deserve it too? Heck yeah. But you know what? The kids deserve it more. And that's the message of our book and our movement, basically. So Adam, in July of last year, you published Run Like a Pirate, Push Yourself to Get More Out of Life. And this work came out of a, an amazing year, I have to say, that saw you run 12 marathons in 12 months, if I have that right. That is unbelievable. So talk to us about the heart of this book, Run Like a Pirate. How can this book help educators and just inspire people in general? So I actually ran 13 marathons. That, oh, that 13. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll explain. No, I'll, I'll explain. So the run like a pirate, I never intended to write that book. And I had, I had quite a few friends tell me, dude, you got to write a book about this. And I was like, really? Like, who's going to want to read this about just me running? And as the year went on, I, I, the people that I was very public about my running, I would upload daily, multiple times a day on Instagram and and tweets just about training and what I was eating. And people started people that I know that I know don't even exercise, forget run, started like starting an exercise program. And people would say, "Gosh, I've lost twenty pounds," and I saw myself as maybe maybe I can help people live a better life and not just, you know, maybe lose weight or get in shape and, and be healthier, but to also just, you know, to feel better and to maybe take that message into a different space of like, Hey, I can do more in my life. So I talked to my publisher and they said, Hey, we'd love to publish it. And the weird thing is I tried to write the book during 2017, during my racing year, but I couldn't, I, I, I just, I didn't have I didn't have it. So I finished the year and then I actually wrote the book in two months entirely on airplanes. I flew a bunch for speaking in January and February of 2018. And I, I wrote the entire book in two months on airplanes. And um, I would just tell people like the book is about running, but it's not about running. That's my Zen response. Basically, whatever you do, you can do more. You have more. At the beginning of my marathon year, I didn't even know if I was going to be able to finish all the marathons. Like, can somebody run 13 marathons in one year? I, I didn't know. Um, and I turned out that I did. And the spoiler of the book, there's a chapter called The Hardest Part. I'll tell you right now, it wasn't that hard. And people kind of look at me and like roll their eyes like, really? But it wasn't because when you prepare yourself and when you – want something so bad and you tell people and you have people in your circle and and you do all the all the necessary work it actually isn't that hard you're just going through the process so i say i ran 13 marathons because in in june of that year i realized my december marathon was going to be my 19th marathon of my life and i didn't want to i didn't wow. want to end on that uneven number so i ran my december marathon twice i ran it backwards from the finish line to the start at 1 a.m., I woke up at midnight and ran the race backwards. So that was number 19. And then I turned around and ran the rest of the race back with everybody else. So I got 20. And then I actually added an another race. I wasn't done. Two weeks later, after that back-to-back -back marathon, I actually ran a 24-hour race, which is exactly what it sounds like. You run for 24 hours. It was at Chrissy Field in San Francisco. It was a mile loop on New Year's Eve, and you run a mile loop for a day, and you just run as many miles as you can. And my goal was 100, and I ran 103. And I just tell people, we are just sitting on so many reserves and so much potential in our bodies and in our brain. And I would say, if you're a runner, you're going to enjoy the book. And even if you're not, 
you're going to get something out of it for whatever you do. If you don't run, you don't even want to run, whatever it is, it's just going to show you that when you put your mind to something, you can do it, period. That's it. Well, there is so much there, and I, I have so many questions. I know also from your Twitter profile, I think you're a vegan as well, and so I have so yeah. many diet questions yeah, man. along with that. But I, I really like the overall message, and I want to come back to that, and I think it fits well with the growth mindset, and that is you know, we're always capable of moving forward. And so often, you know, people like to label themselves and say, oh, I'm not a runner. And really, to finish that sentence, it's I'm not a runner yet. And it sounds like you'd agree that just moving incrementally along that scale, moving a little bit further, running a little bit further each time, pushing ourselves, there's, there's always far more, as you put it, potential within each of us. I love that. I mean, saying you're saying you're not a runner is it's kind of demeaning. Like, what do you mean you're not a runner? It's all perspective. If you believe you're something, then you're gonna be that something. If you're like, yeah, I can run, or if you're like, well, I'm not that great of a teacher. Like, well, then you just put yourself, you know, three three feet behind everybody else. And no matter what it is in your life, if you see it and you believe it, then you can be it. And the more you see it, and the more you believe it, and the more you tell yourself the more you're going to have in your life. And then when you do that, actually, your students see that and then they start believing it in themselves too because they see you, the role model in the classroom, doing it and seeing it and believing it and then being it. And to me, that's like the that's the end game right there is the kids. You're going to become a better teacher and a better uh, husband, father, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever it may be because – you're pushing yourself and you're changing the perspective and you're changing the outcome for yourself. So, um, you know what, like put yourself in the spotlight to yourself, period. Forget what other people think, forget what other people may think, do it for yourself and be positive. I think that's really, really important. Love it. Okay. So Adam, on a personal note, I'm going to cheat a little bit here on the podcast and just ask for some personal advice. Okay. So coming up in a couple of weeks, I'm running a 10 kilometer, 6.2 mile race, which I know is just like a little walk across the parking lot for you. <laughs> but um, it, it, so it's kind of small time, but it's run with a ton of people, usually 40 to 50,000 other people. So wow. uh, number one, I don't know if you ever run races that short, maybe not, but what would be your coaching advice for a run of that length and with that many people? What, what do you think my strategy should be for that? I always recommend people, if you're experienced or not, is you can always speed up. So I always say start out a little bit slow, see how you're feeling, take some deep breaths. You know, I'm not a huge fan of looking around. I, the brain, your brain actually takes a lot of calories away from your body when you're looking around and when you're thinking. So I think if you're there mm. to run a race, focus on the race. Look in front of you. Look at your feet. Don't be looking at the people that are holding signs and looking at the scenery. Like I'm not there to see the scenery. I'm there to run a race. And I think when you become more focused like that, you actually focus on your objective and, uh, and you get through it and, uh, just, you know what, like enjoy it, you know, just enjoy it because it, it's talk about a great community event. I mean, with 40 to 50,000 people, you're just part of a really big community right now for that period of time. And, your time is not important because this is not your job. You're not trying to train for the Olympics. And some people just put so much stress on themselves. I am so calm, like seconds before a race. I ran a marathon last weekend and I'm just completely calm because I'm, I want to be there. Nobody's forcing me to be there. This is not like elementary school PE class where you have to go run, run the mile and you have to do that. When you're an adult, it's your choice. So Relax, smile, and enjoy it. That's my best advice. Well, let me ask you one quick, uh, one other quick question here, Adam, about running. And and you've mentioned a few. You've done a ton of marathons. So, out of them all, and I'm sure you get asked this sometimes, which one is your favorite? In either in terms of, uh, and and you said you don't look at the scenery, but just in terms <laughs> of maybe the environment yeah. or the the setting. I mean, w which one would rank the highest for you? Yeah, so I've run 24 marathons mm. in New York. New York City is my favorite. Awesome. Definitely. That is just the just the energy. You run over all the bridges. You come into, into Central Park. 
I actually ran Boston Marathon last year. It was the worst weather in like 30, 30 or 35 years. It rained and was like 30 degrees the entire day. It was, it was crazy weather. But that, was, that was a fun one, but New York, New York's my favorite. So if you want to run a, an amazing race, go run New York Marathon. It was special. So Adam, as you look around education, and you mentioned that you're seeing quite a few different contexts in your current capacity, what is exciting you out there in education? What do you see today that, that really has amazing potential for learning? Yeah, I think, I mean, all the technology that we have and maker spaces, and I think, I think it's really, really powerful. And I think the most important, exciting thing that I, I see is just, I believe just giving our classrooms back to our students. Uh, I think, and I know teachers are more important than ever. Teachers are just important in different ways. 30 years ago, the teacher was the end all in the classroom. They knew all the information. Kids really couldn't do much without the teacher. But now in 2019, the teacher, I think, is really the facilitator of the learning experience in the classroom. And I'll tell you, to be honest, like this is not happening in, in droves and waves across the country or any continent, you know, for that matter. But I see it a lot. I see teachers really backing up and taking a more of a facilitation role. And I'm not saying all the time, but at times when when they can. And when you do that, you actually free up so much time for yourself to build more relationships with kids or to work with kids on a one-on-one basis or to you know work with four kids on the carpet with some intervention that they need working on. And kids really are owning their, owning their learning. I, I really think that kids need to learn how to learn the tools are out there with Chromebooks and iPads and Google and Alexa and everything else. I mean, information is commoditized because you can get information from anywhere. And um, that's something that I think is something that we need to do more of. Teachers just backing off. Teachers getting over what they don't know and being okay with it because teachers still know kids. Teachers still know relationships. Teachers still know what the right questions to ask to prompt thinking. But if a teacher doesn't know how to do something, some type of new technology, it's okay. Don't wait. Put a kid in charge and you help facilitate the learning for them through that new tool that the kids know how to do. I think that's probably the most exciting thing that I see. And that's probably something that I think about and something that I, I, need, to, I need to write about more um, because I think that's the way that we're going to go farther and faster and do bigger and better things with our, with our classrooms and with our kids. And also to keep teachers in, to, to actually keep teachers in the profession. I mean, teachers are leaving the profession because they're stressed out and burned out because of testing and so many other things. And I think that's actually a way to bring joy and happiness back to the classroom. So teachers don't have so much pressure and stress on themselves. I think that's one of the biggest keys, one of the biggest wins with inquiry-based learning, project-based learning and, and maker spaces mm-hmm. and, and some of the other things you mentioned is that honestly, it just your energy changes. You're, you move into that coaching mode and conferencing and all these other things that we actually want to do as teachers, but sometimes we just don't have the energy to do it when, when we feel like everything in the room depends on us. So that's right. you put that so well. Now, I, I normally like to ask educators in the field, Adam, about a professional goal. I mean, you're not really accountable to a district at the moment, but I know you're a goal-driven guy. So what is next for Mr. Adam? Welcome. What are you working on? You mentioned the book. Maybe that's it. Or is there something else that you're really focused on right now? So I'll break this down into two things, one educational and one personal. The first, the educational piece is... It's, I'm really focusing on doing more, 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 more video content. I think video, I know video is where the world is. And I think we need, we need to do way more video in education. So I'm going to be producing and putting out a lot more video content, which I think, um, you know, video just gets more play and gets more engagement and more excitement. So I think if I can do that and help to inspire and, um, instigate that change in schools. I think that's going to be um, helpful. And from a personal standpoint, I've kind of wondered, like people ask me like, what's next after you're all your running marathons. And (laughs) I've run, I've run like a handful of marathons uh, in 2018 and 2019. So I'm actually going to do um, a back to back to back to back marathon in a couple of weeks. So in the Bay area, we have 
the Golden Gate Bridge, we have the Bay Bridge, we have uh, the Benicia Bridge, and the Carquinas Bridge. And those are, we have more bridges than that, but those are the four bridges that actually pedestrians can walk on. There's a walking path. So I'm going to run um, four marathons in four days across those four bridges, just back and forth, back and forth until I get 26.2. Wow. And, you know, you can just rest on your laurels and you can become comfortable. Or you can push yourself and you know what? It's going to hurt. It's going to be hard, but you just got to put one foot in front of the other. And I just challenge everyone listening to put one foot in front of the other, to challenge yourself and to do what's hard. It, it's hard to do what's hard because being comfortable is easy, but nobody grew in the comfort zone. Nobody innovated in the comfort zone. Nobody really changed and did amazing things in the comfort zone. So it's time to get uncomfortable and it's time to push yourself and it's going to hurt and you may cry and you may <laughs> want to stop, but you just got to keep going and put one foot in front of the other. You have so much of that Dave Burgess intensity, Adam, you know, I, I'm <laughs> listening to you and hearing what you're saying about video and I'm sure you've come across Mr. Gary Vaynerchuk and he's got D rock by his side, right? Who, oh. Who's constantly kind of filming him yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and rolling all his, uh, his rants into beautiful uh, videos and, and compilations. And, yeah. and, you know, I, I think Gary's really onto something there. I, I know we can't all do that, but I feel like, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you're not familiar with him and, and not all of his stuff is going to be for every educator. Uh, he's pretty intense, but just that idea of documenting yeah. and curating and sharing. And, and I completely agree that that video is so accessible. It, it's coming onto our TVs now, you know, here in my family, we just cut cable and we're more yeah. a YouTube net, Netflix kind of family now. And uh, so I think getting out that message, yeah. I completely agree is, uh, is important. I need to do that too. Well, and if you look at kids, what do kids consume? They consume video. Totally. And I think, you know, yeah. don't give kids hot dogs if they want burritos. Don't give them a worksheet <laughs> and a textbook when they want to watch videos and they want to learn that way. And information is just out there and we should be creating our own and kids should be creating their own. I don't want to see any more tri-fold cardboard presentations at the science fair. Have a kid create a video about their science fair and put the Chromebook up at the science fair and people can just watch the video as they go by. And yeah. cause then you can share that with grandma in India or Canada or wherever the heck you live. It doesn't matter. And who, who knows who else may see it. Right. Nobody's going to see that. Nobody wants to look at that still picture of your cardboard presentation. It's just not where our world is. And I think the sooner we can get to where actually the outside world is into our classrooms, the better we're going to be. Oh man, this is, this is gold. Okay. So <laughs> I, I love it. Um, I think you're going to run a marathon soon, man. Oh, I think we're going to sign you up. Oh man. That, yeah. You know, it, it's on the bucket list, but <laughs> oh, okay. That's another conversation. <laughs> speechless. The podcast host is speechless. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's the power of public accountability and I, I'm, I'm watching my words here because if once I commit to this thing and it's on a podcast forever, then I got to do it. Right. So. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's the whole point. <laughs> so outside of education, Adam, we've talked a lot about running and I love what we've, what we've covered there in the areas of content creation. Is there another area or uh, let's say obsession that really lights your fire and brings you alive as a human being these days? Yeah. Uh, other than my, other than my family, I have two kids and an amazing wife. Um, I gotta, I obviously gotta put them in there. Uh, I love reading leadership books and I don't, I don't read educational leadership books. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of military leadership and I was never in the military, but I love, I love military leadership because it just makes sense and they simplify steps to get to where they need to be for the ob objective. And um, Jocko Willink is, has an amazing podcast, the Jocko, you know, uh, the Jocko podcast. And yeah. He's got two amazing books. He has some amazing children's books too. And, um, and he's just one of, my, one of my many favorites. But they just, military leadership just breaks it down. There, um, there's a great book, How to, How to Lead Like a Navy Seal. Uh, it's an older book, but they just, it's just simple. And if you're an administrator or a teacher or a superintendent, or a high school student, you know, everybody is a leader. Everyone has leadership capacity inside of them. And when you break it down and you simplify it, 
so many books, I think a lot of education books really complicate leadership. When you simplify it into three to five simple steps that are attainable, then you actually get things done. So I've long been a, a proponent and a fan of military leadership. And I would say, tell people just to maybe add one of those books to your genre and your, and your repertoire of what you read to become a better leader. Because when you're a better leader, your students are better leaders. And as you can tell, my theme is everything that we do leads back to the kids. Um, it's important, obviously, self-care and doing things for yourself. But when you do things and you push yourself, they actually trickle down to your classroom and your students see that and they end up benefiting. So I think that's really, really an important concept to think about. Adam, I was thinking about Jocko while you were talking, and I'm glad you you brought him up. My wife uh, was going through his audio book earlier this year, and just that voice is so commanding. Yeah. If you haven't heard Jocko, you got to check yeah, him out. He's, he's, man. he's got that great podcast as well. What is a personal habit or maybe a productivity hack, some kind of an app or a trick or a routine that you go through that contributes to your success on a daily basis? Yeah, no apps. Um my, I, I'm a huge proponent of making your bed right when you wake up. Uh, my kids are my kids are eight and six, and they've been making their own bed since they were three years old, and they just know that's the routine. You wake up and you make your bed. So um, I actually I used to do this. My wife broke me of this. I would make my side of the bed while she was still in her side of the bed. <laughs> I don't do that anymore, um, but I, I used to for the, our first few years of marriage. And I just think making your bed is a really important thing because when you and I've heard actually I've heard military generals and admirals talk about this. It's funny how it how things coincide. You just start the day off right, and then your backpack is going to be organized, and then your your car is going to be organized. I'm also just another huge proponent of waking up early. Um, I, I wake up between four and four 30 every day and, um, starting the day off, right. Starting the day off early. I've done that since I was in high school. I used to wake up at five in the morning when I was in high school and middle school. Uh, you just get a jump start on the day and you just, you're just organized. You have things out the night before. So you wake up and you're ready to go and there's no rushing and you're not late and there's no stress. And, um, yeah, just, uh, start your day off, right. That's the key thing for me. Adam, it's time for your quick picks, the education voices and resources that are shaping your work and inspiring your thinking today. So starting at Twitter, tell us about someone we should follow there and share why they've been inspiring you lately. Oh my gosh, I follow 32,000 people on Twitter, but I would say <laughs> my favorite person lately is Ray Hewitt, um, at R-A-E-H-U-G-H-A-R-T. And Ray is a, a new, a longtime Twitter friend and actually a new in, in-person friend. And uh, she, she's a middle school math teacher in Illinois. And she's got a podcast, the Teach Better Talk podcast. She's a, she's a consultant. She speaks and she actually still teaches full time. And she's just positive. She's smart. Follow her on Instagram. She has amazing Instagram stories where you can just kind of follow what's going on in um in her classroom and, and see what's going on. So definitely check out Ray. She's uh she's the real deal for sure. Fantastic. I, I love the Ray Hewitt pick. She was, uh, she appeared here on teachers on fire back at episode 73, just a few episodes back. So definitely check that one out next. Adam point us to an ed tech tool that you currently love using in your work, something that is making your life better somehow. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of like note taking apps. I've used Evernote for gosh, probably 10 years. And there are a lot of different uh, tools out there. I think OneNote, Google Keep, but uh, just having something that syncs across all of your devices, your phone, your laptop, your iPad, everything else. I'm a huge proponent of Evernote. You can upload PDFs, you can record voice comments. It's just, you can share folders with people. Evernote has been a longtime favorite of mine. Recommend a book, one that you've been reading lately or one of your all-time faves and tell us why you recommend it. So I'm going to go back to Jocko and um, Extreme Ownership was his first book that he wrote with uh, Leif, Leif Babin, who was another former Navy SEAL. And just the leadership lessons that I got from his book um, have been invaluable, and I recommend that book to pretty much anyone all the time. They have a new book, The Dichotomy of Leadership. I would read the other one first. Super awesome. 
I know you're a podcast producer and I'd like you to speak to that briefly, but also tell us about another one that you're really enjoying on your daily commute, or I guess in your case on in the, uh, in some of your air travel that you do pretty frequently, but what is, what is in your podcast deck? So mm, my second, my top, my, my top two favorite podcasts are the Jocko podcast. This is like a Jocko love fest today, but um, please, please excuse me. Um, and I would say Rich Roll. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge Rich Roll fan. If you don't know Rich Roll, check out his podcast. He has long form podcasts, like two, two and a half hours, but he's absolutely amazing. And um, I'm just a huge fan of Rich Roll and his message and what he does and what he says and and uh, everything else. So check out Rich Roll. And then tell us about your podcast as well, Adam. So uh, I have an old podcast, Kids Deserve It podcast with Todd Nessaloni, my co-author, co-founder. We've taken a hiatus from that podcast because we've had other projects going on. But my new podcast is the Ask Adam and Ryan show that I do with Ryan Sheehy, who is a principal in the uh, elementary principal in the Bay Area. And basically, you have questions and we have answers. We just answer questions from Twitter on our podcast. It's kind of like a short, quick and dirty, um, and it's fun. We just like to get the message out there. So. Yeah. We talked about YouTube earlier and I would encourage the listeners to make sure to hop onto YouTube and subscribe to Adam's channel. Is there one that you're subscribed to that you're checking regularly and and gaining inspiration from? Yeah, my man, my man, CJ Reynolds is a high school teacher in West Philadelphia and his YouTube channel is called Real Rap with Reynolds. And uh, he's just a prolific uh, YouTuber Check him on Instagram. He's uh, he's just awesome. I get I get daily inspiration from my boy CJ, and I think you will uh, enjoy his YouTube channel as well. I'm going to second that, Adam. Love his stuff. My boys have gotten to know him because I've had him on the TV so many times, and uh, also another former guest of Teachers on Fire. So great pick there on YouTube. Adam, what are the best ways for the listeners to follow you and connect more with the Kids Deserve It message? Yeah, so Kids Deserve It is kidsdeserveit.com or at Kids Deserve It. For me, I am at Mr. Adam Welcome. It's M-R, Adam Welcome, just how it sounds, at Twitter, on Instagram, on Voxer, and also um, Mr. Adam Welcome.com on my uh, on my website, and I'm just uh, Adam Welcome at YouTube. If you just if you just Google Adam Welcome, um, I'm kind of all over the internet. You'll uh, you'll find me in many different places. Sounds good, Adam. Again, thank you so much for sharing your time with the podcast today. It feels like I've had so many awesome, amazing people coming out of California lately. I don't know what's going on there, but uh, <laughs> this was really, really good, and I feel more inspired. Not not only in education, but I also feel inspired to run. So thank you for that message that number one, kids come first. And number two, we've got more inside of us than we realize. Take care, Adam, and let's talk again soon. Sounds good. Thanks so much for joining me here today on the Teachers on Fire podcast. For show notes and links from this episode, visit teachersonfire.net. You can also follow the show at Teachers on Fire on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Medium. And again, please do subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm your host, Tim Cavey, saying goodbye for now, and we'll catch you next time right here on the Teachers on Fire podcast.